Hello everyone and welcome to Ed Zotta Review's World Tour! Since I've just been released from my North Korean prison, I'm ready to roam the world again. These five episodes are all about visiting countries that are not Japan, the US or a well-known European country, and shine a light on the history of this country's car industry. And this is destination number three. When I think of the Czech Republic, I think of wonderful old world architecture, a great selection of beers, unpronounceable dishes and hot local women that are wanting to meet in your area. Huh? I should check my browser history. Anyway, these are just stereotypes because welcome everyone to episode 26 of the Automotive History series where I present you my Bohemian Rhapsody of the history of the Czech car industry, the Czech Republic. It's a bit more than just Skoda. The auto industry in Austria-Hungary, as the area we now know as the Czech Republic was part of at the time, started off much like any other well-industrialized country. At the turn of the century, all over the country, fathers and sons who formerly worked on repairing bikes, carriages and motorcycles gave a shot at making their first automobile, motor car or whatever you name it. The president being touted as Austro-Hungary's very first petrol-fueled motor car in 1897. The car was built by Nesseldorfer Wagenbau Fabriksgesellschaft AG, and that sounds rather German, but remember, this was during the Austria-Hungary period and not so much a Czech affair, other than that the factory was located in Moravia, which is part of the current day Czech... You probably know what I mean. The president was somewhat of a hodgepodge. The two-cylinder four-stroke engine was outsourced from Benz, maker of the very first motor car ever, and the body was actually a carriage carryover. But it also featured a differential and an actual bumper, quite unique at the time. Now, NW might have been the first, but it was rivaling Lorrain and Clement that quickly became the country's largest car maker a couple years later in 1905. Laurent Clement was a company that created bicycles, motorcycles and everything in between, so it wasn't all that difficult to glue two motorcycles together and voila, the car was born. They sold various cars under exciting model names like the A, B, C and E. Seeing that cars would develop into an attractive market niche, another contender popped up a few years later. Praga, Latin for Prague. Although they did have somewhat of a false start, as the first vehicles they built were under license of the Italian company Isotta Francini. The bottom line is that many of these newly found car companies either already existed by making something different, like motorcycles like Laurent and Clement and Yawa, or besides building cars, had some other side jobs like building engines, freight trucks or aircraft parts like Aero and Tatra. And now that I'm talking about airplanes, let's get back at Nesseldorfer Wagenbau Fabriksgesellschaft AG. That's a rather long name, and after testing one of their vehicles in the Tatra mountain range, one of the spectators screamed, This car was just made for these Tatras. And thus the name was born, or so the legend goes. Tatra, as a company, was blessed with this man, Hans Lenvinka, who quickly became chief design engineer. This gift from God is renowned for the invention of two things. Number one is the introduction of the so-called backbone chassis, a setup with swing axles, fully independent suspension. This setup wasn't entirely new, but Lenvinka further developed and improved the concept. And number two... Ledwinka was among the first to understand that aerodynamics could play a huge role in automobile design. Both these ideas came together in the shape and form of the Tatra T11 in 1923. What makes this car rather unique is its closed and sloped front end. Take a look. This is what your average car in 1923 looks like, with a flat vertical grille, and then suddenly this slippery slope comes along. Ten years later, the Great Depression broke out and also influenced Czechoslovakia, as the country was now known after the First World War. In search for a small, simple and economical people's car, many Czechoslovakian car companies went to work to offer their version of this idea. Praga came up with the Praga Baby in 1934, Jawa came up with the Jawa 700, also in 1934, Laurent Clement, now bought out by Skoda and became known as such, released the Skoda Popular, again in 1934. And Tatra was also working on a small economy car, but wanted to move a step further. 
The foundations were already exquisite. The backbone frame proved useful for small car design. The engine was in the rear. The car was rear wheel drive, so no drive shaft, and as a result, an almost flat floor. Almost no engine noise, and all the room you would want for your front suspension, as there is no engine there. And on top of all this, a very aerodynamic body. Look at this. I mean, remove the front and rear fenders and it almost becomes a pontoon design, only introduced some 10 years later. A front end with no grille and integrated headlights. Very revolutionary for that time period. The concept would eventually become the Tatra V570, but was put back on the shelf as the already existing Tatra 57 was selling very well, and Tatra saw no need to invest money in something this radical. One might notice that this concept looks rather similar to the early versions of the Volkswagen Beetle, and that is no surprise. Ledwinka and Ferdinand Porsche were business-related friends, so to speak, and Ledwinka every so often had dinner with this guy named Adolf Hitler. Hitler was an auto aficionado and was especially fond of Ledwinka's aerodynamic ideas and concepts. Porsche looked over Ledwinka's shoulder when Hitler ordered the development of a German people's car and he especially took an interest in the air-cooled engine. By the time the Beetle was released, Tatra wasn't all too happy that they saw a direct copy of the V570 concept and tried to sue Porsche and Volkswagen for stealing the design. Porsche was about to give in but it's Hitler that tapped on Porsche's shoulder and whispered, you might want to delay this for a couple years. And boom, next thing you know, Germany invades Czechoslovakia and Tatra had to shut up. But back to the V570 concept. It was never realized as an affordable people's car, but later used for the exact opposite, a large luxury car. The first iteration of what became Tatra's most iconic model, the Tatra 77. I dare to say that that car is one of the few revolutionary cars that come around every couple decades or so, like the Citroën DS from the 1950s and maybe even the Tesla Model S of today. Take a look at this picture. On your right, your average 1930s regular production cars, and on your left, a Tatra. See how revolutionary and radical the design is, with its sloped rear end and massive center fin? The 77 was ultra aerodynamic with a presumed drag coefficient of just 0.24, and in comparison, today's Teslas have roughly the same drag coefficient. In 1939, Germany invaded Czechoslovakia, and many of the auto factories were either demolished, shut down, or converted to make war material. Car production was tough, but the Germans, including Hitler, were very impressed with the airplane like Tatra, and limited production continued. Tatras became known as the ultimate Autobahn mobile, and the so-called Czech silent weapon, as many German officials died in car crashes as a result of high-speed driving their 77s. Rumor has it that Hitler personally banned his top officials from driving Tatras ever again. As soon as the Second World War was over, many small car makers dropped building cars and focused on other markets, but a few stayed. Some even had minor success selling microcars, like Velorex. What didn't help is that Czechoslovakia was almost immediately taken over by the new Soviet Union, and so the country became known as the CSSR, the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic, and a satellite state of the Soviet Union. Naturally, the influence of the Soviet Union would seep through the Czechoslovakian car industry. Many companies went under. Praga closed up shop, and so did Aero and Yawa, after making the Aero Minor, a moderately successful car in the late 40s. And, well, what remained were pretty much Skoda and Tatra. And they had to survive in a one-party, planned economy, communist country. The Soviets had some ideas. Skoda was going to be the people's car manufacturer of the CSSR. Tatra was going to be the new luxury brand. Oh, no, 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 not for regular folks, but only for the party's officials, of course. The result was an updated 77, better known as the Tatra T600 Tatra Plan. And you better be careful if one of these rolled around through town, or even worse, stopped right in front of your house. And if that wasn't enough, the party officials could also choose to ride in a Skoda VOS, but was only offered for a limited time until Skoda was ordered to only make people's cars. 
The Tatra plan evolved to become the Tatra 603. This rather sinister looking car was allocated to government officials and you really had to go through a lot of hoops as an average check to get one for private use. The 603 would remain the official car of choice for the coming decades and was praised for its high speed, despite having a rather modest V8 engine with quite low power output, but never underestimate the power of aerodynamics. The car was regarded as the Cadillac of the Czech Republic and among the Russian Chaikas the luxury car offering of the Soviet Union. Since the CSSR was locked in between the Soviet Union on one side and divided Germany on the other side and being part of the so-called Eastern Bloc, plenty of crappy communist cars were pouring in and dominated the local market. From Russia, with love, you had a fine selection of Gazes, Ladas and Moskvitches. And from East Germany, it were cars like the Volkswagen Beetle, Wattbergs, and finally Trabants that ruled the Czech roads. As mentioned, Skoda in the meantime also focused on making smaller economy cars with their greatest hits, such as the Octavia and the 1000 MB. With a little uprising in 1968 forcibly put down by the Soviet Union, the Czechs stayed under communist rule for over 40 years. It became another Eastern Bloc country, full of communist cars. How long was this going to keep on going? Well, how the Berlin Wall suddenly fell in 1989, so did a thing or two go down in Czechoslovakia. As soon as the Soviet Union collapsed, it was Slovakia that said, hey, it's been a great couple decades, but we're going to go now, bye. And in a peaceful manner, the country split. And what is left is what we know by now as the Czech Republic. With the withdrawal of the Soviet connections, one-party systems and overprotective economies, the car market opened up in the early 1990s, and there couldn't have been a better time. Skoda was in a bad position. 40 years of plant economy didn't do the company any favors. Whereas Skoda used to make great cars such as the Superb 3000 and the Popular, it now had resorted to make bottom basement economy cars with such dreadful models like the Skoda 125. It's around this time Skoda became the laughing stock of Europe. Only if you really had to, you drove a Skoda. Otherwise you wouldn't want to be seen in these hopelessly outdated post-communistic pieces of cheapness. With the formation of the Republic in 1989, one year later the government ordered the privatization of its many industries. Through tenders, foreign companies could take an interest in Skoda, if they wanted. Volkswagen was deemed the most qualified, as they saw potential in Skoda to turn its weakness into a strength. Cheapness would become value for money. The first positive result of this new ownership was the 1994 Skoda Felicia, essentially a reworked favorite that was a leftover of communist times. But it was a huge leap forward. Sure, the car was still rather cheap, but it now offered a fine selection of engines, higher quality materials, and better equipment and engineering. From here on out, it was a long way up for Skoda. Sure, one can argue if these are truly Skoda cars, when almost all of them are based on Volkswagen architecture and platform, but today Skoda is truly regarded as a fine value for money brand, for those that care what is in it, and not what badge is glued onto the hood. For those that want space, and a great example is the Skoda Superb, with Mercedes S-Class level of legroom for a Skoda price. Volkswagen managed to turn the Skoda brand into a sales success, Take a look. Whereas in 1990, right after the fall of the CSSR, Skoda only made 172,000 cars. Now, 40 years later, they make over 1 million cars annually. But whereas Skoda was on a rise, Tatra was on the decline. How so? Well, once again, 40 years of planned economy didn't do the company any favors. With a closed-off economy and no real outside competitors, the Tatra 603 and later on the updated 613 were exquisite by Soviet standards, meaning anything bigger than a lot is terrific. But by Western European standards, it was an okay car, but getting increasingly outdated. As soon as the CSSR fell, and the industry was exposed to the international market, mostly European luxury brands started to pour in, and Tatra was no match with their outdated models and very limited funds. They still tried, however, with the Tatra 700, but it was only offered for two years, and only 70 units were sold, which couldn't justify the development costs by any means. 
The Czech government stepped in financially and saved Tatra from bankruptcy on the condition that they stopped making passenger cars and only focused on what they were really good at, making freight trucks. And they continue to do so today. Today, the Czech car industry has never been in a better shape. The industry is doing really well and makes up 35% of the overall Czech economy. Skoda currently offers a wide selection of models and a solid entry into the electric car market. The Tatra story is a bit sad, however, as there was so much potential, limited by 40 years of planned economy. Imagine what it could have been today. And that's the bottom line. The Czech car industry has proven itself to be revolutionary, inventing daring designs and concepts, and also to be strong, to rise up after decades of being limited by world wars and foreign powers. And to that I say, Viborně! Now, I'm heading over to the airport to catch my flight to the next destination. You'll see. (laughs) 